and we are live mm -hmm. and recording and welcome everybody it's the it's episode 14 of Research Software Hour with Richard and Anne and me and we will talk today about how to tame the cluster how to run things on a supercomputer and yes really how to how to move from something that runs on a, on a laptop onto the cluster how to find out how many cores and how much memory to use, all the pitfalls that we typically fall in, into. Welcome, everybody. Yes. Welcome. So we typically take questions via HackMD. So you can write, I just pasted the link in the Twitch chat. So you can open this and then write questions and you can get asynchronous answers. And we also watch that and try to answer everything by the end of the show. So, should we begin? Maybe we can say that it connects a little bit to a last session mm -hmm. where we already we talked about cluster etiquette. Right. But I yeah. think this time we take it a little bit further. Yeah. And we will spend some time in the terminal and we will show really how to set up scripts and how to run them and what to look what to look out for yeah we're basically continuing from there so yeah i guess one of our first uh things to say was what can go wrong if you run on a cluster and you don't carefully control your execution environment so what do you all say Yeah, many things can go wrong. Uh, I already mentioned this thing like, goes wrong usually the <laughs> first time. Uh, it, it, it's normal. Yeah, it's normal. It's a good yeah. point. I think it never it never works the first time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think since it never works the first time, uh, one of the messages that I will try to get across is to grow your calculation. So don't start with a big calculation immediately because there will be problems on the way. So mm -hmm. I like to start really small, a small example that runs few seconds, one minute on few processors. And mm -hmm. once this is working, I go longer calculation, more processors. So mm -hmm. I will come back to that. Yes. And speaking of processors, so few things that can go wrong is, well, uh, requesting many processors and using only a few <laughs> mm -hmm. or requesting few processors and <laughs> using a bit too many. Mm -hmm or regularly requesting many processors, but the code doesn't scale to that many processors. Right. Yeah. So they are doing something, but it's not really useful. Yeah. And maybe we need to clarify these, these sentences. Yeah. Yes, most likely. Should we clarify by doing and trying to do it wrong and detect it? Yeah, I think that's the best. Yeah, let's, okay. Let's try to make some mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> So let's see, we've got the basic script. Should we start where we were yesterday? Oh, last week. Last, last week. week. Yes, last week. Oops. OK. Um, so and maybe we can try on your cluster, since we will do some mistakes, or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah we don't do mistakes on your cluster. <laughs> mm, OK, I'm switching to my screen here. So here we are. I'm already on the cluster. So being a clever person, I will put everything in a git directory. Mm, so I have this alias for cloning from GitHub. And we um, are here already on the cluster, right? Yes. So that's the, lo the login node. Yes, this is the login we, node on the cluster. And we remember from last time that that's the place where we normally edit files and mm -hmm. submit calculations, but we will not really, we will try to avoid running any lengthy computations on this login node. Yeah. So in this directory here, and I guess I can paste it into the chat, the example I'm doing. And there was also a good comment on on Twitch here. Yeah. Uh, something that often goes wrong: messy setup, non-reproducible mess. Yes. 
and, and I think today let's try to be reproducible here. So we already created the Git repository. We will also then document all the dependencies in the in the script. Yeah. So we've got code, and the first thing we do is make it run on the login node. So this is a script that calculates pi via a stochastic algorithm, and we give it some number of iterations. Like let's do one million. And well, it's Python and slow, so it takes a little while, but we see the pi estimate is 3.140. So. Hmm. And the nice thing about yeah. this example is that we can make it longer by increasing the number. Right, yeah, so maybe we should time it. So we have this time command, which is a shell built in. And let's make it a little bit longer. Let's make it 10 million. So if I remember right, this took about six seconds or so. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So what will we do next? How do we get this to run? OK, 13 seconds. Yeah, yeah that sounds good. So maybe the first thing we would do is run it interactively. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. I mean, with a yes, with an interactive. Uh, we did it last time already. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. And by interactive, um, you mean on an interactive compute node? Yes. Mm, yeah. Because already now we kind of ran interactively. On the right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hmm. that's a good question. So if I do it this way, is this how you do it on your clusters to run interactively? This is not exactly, well. You need to specify a bit more than so, this. So this is not exactly interactive, but it runs it on a compute node. Hmm. Is this how you would run interactively on your cluster? No. No. OK. No. I would allocate. So wait for a node until I get it, and then on that node, I would then run the interactive nodes. Mm -hmm. But that's what you do now already. But what do you uh, ask for by default, uh, So How many resources do you have? The default is 15 minutes and 500 megabytes of memory here. Well, anyway, there's many different ways to get an interactive job on your cluster. And this is something that I think probably many different sites have different ways of doing. Mm -hmm. So here I've got something on a compute node. Yeah. Another way we do this is S interactive, which I guess is similar to the interactive that is in the Twitch chat. Oh yeah, I never use that one. <laughs> This is some custom command, which I think was originally made by someone in Sweden, so probably based on what uh, we're seeing in the chat there. OK. There's an error message we can ignore, because that's my shell doing weird stuff. Mm -hmm. So we see here we are on node PE4. So we can run it. Uh, Ten million, and let's time it also. So after this, what will we do? So here, can you remind us uh, the main advantage to do this compared to the interactive? Yeah. So to me, the main advantage is that we're proving that there's nothing that it really depends on that's specific to, specific to the login mode. Like, is the software slightly different? So it will fail. And you don't interfere with other uh, yeah, right. user right. on the login. Right, yeah. I guess this is so short that I wouldn't care. But if it took a few minutes, then this would be nicer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the next step now will be to put that into a script. Yes. Yes. So I'll come back to the login node. And here we are. And then let's make the script. So I gave it the extension slurm, which doesn't 
really have any particular meaning. It just reminds me that this is a Slurm script. But how about like one advantage of calling it dot sh would be that it do you get code highlighting if you call it slr? Mm, I think I would if I start it with bash. Okay, good. All right. But oh yeah, okay, nice. But I, I thought think, it wouldn't. Yeah. But I think I will have to reload it, and then it detects it. Hmm. Yes. Okay. okay. So let's see. So what do we do here? We run the we code. First, yeah, we do the same that we did outside. But we need to give a little bit more. So in front of it, we need to tell Slurm what we ask for. Mm -hmm. How many, how many tasks? So how many processors? Yes. Course, and how long time? Mm -hmm. How much memory? Sometimes you need to specify the account. And if maybe maybe in your case, if you don't, you know, it takes the default. Yeah. On the Norwegian machines, you have we have to specify the account. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. On our cluster, basically, you only have to specify the resources you need. Yeah. That's a good point about the on the chat about using the interactive node. So you reserve the whole node or all the processors, but you're only using it part of the time, which is not that great if you don't remember to close it. But it, it depends how you ask, because mm -hmm. I mean, at least in Norway, you need to specify the number of processors you, you want. Mm -hmm. and you always need to specify the number of processors. As far as I know, yeah. at least mm -hmm. I always do. <laughs> yeah, but it could still be idling, but it can be good for debugging. Yeah. I use yes. it mostly for like debugging if I don't want to wait for every new run. Mm -hmm. But it's true that on a interactive compute nodes, it's often idling most of the time. Yeah. So should we submit this? Does it look good to you? It looks good to me. So in this case, SRAM will actually understand that in this case, it's on one core. Yes. Yeah. So we always recommend people to use srun for the actual process so that it gets accounted for separately. But in this case, um, srun doesn't have much purpose in terms of managing the computing. Can someone remind people what Slurm is? It's a queue management tool. So it was like we had, we had this restaurant. Uh, then we have this restaurant analogy. Mm -hmm. So people queuing up in front of the restaurant waiting for a table. Yes. And then uh, the Slurm is then the, the met metre D. Mm -hmm. so... I don't remember what means this full Slurm, but I remember the S is for simple. That's the only thing uh... I remember. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Like simple Linux utility for resource management, maybe. Okay. Yeah, something like <laughs> that. Good. Good. Yeah. Job. <laughs> I always make the joke that it started off simple, but it's not so simple anymore. And there's this never-ending cycle cycle of things getting too complicated. So people make a new thing that's simpler, and it becomes popular, and then becomes complex, and then it repeats again. <laughs> so we need a new S, S, S. Uh, really or simple. Simpler, simpler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really simple. Always. Yeah. So. Yeah, and we have a command that is still uh, simpler, simpler compared to other yeah. batch systems such as LSS. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Yeah. So we're submitting it with S batch, which means take this script and then run it find the resources and run it. So it's been run. And if I do an ls, we see there is now an output file here, slurm something dot out. And we see that the number is the job ID that got submitted. And just for clarification, I mean, the S batch didn't really run it, but it, it added it to the waiting line. Mm. And in this case, the waiting line was really short, so it started immediately. Yes. So let's take a look. 
So we see it calculates pi via that many trials, the pi estimate. Okay, it looks good. I'll close it. So how would we see the history of this thing? On your clusters, how do you see histories of old jobs? I don't look at the history of old jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, actually. Yeah. So. No idea. Um... So here we have last uh, job. Oh, some people have last job. Yeah, we'd like to have this. <laughs> mm. That might be similar to the Slurm history thing. So Slurm isn't part of Slurm, but is a shell script that interfaces to. Um, we don't have like it. <laughs> jobs. Okay, so this is getting a bit long. Let's see. Can I make this smaller so it fits? Okay, here we go. So we see all of the things that I've recently run. And the most recent one was the submit pi.slurm. We see it requested one gigabyte of memory. It ran in nine seconds. It ran on the node CSL44. And here we see it divided into the different processes, so or different parts. So there's the whole script. There's, I don't know what extra it means. And then there's zero, which is what's in the s run command. And this is the only the Python part took 9.9 seconds. So, so on our cluster, we have this S accounting, this A S A C C T, mm -hmm. where you can see probably very similar to what you have. Yeah. From what I can see with mine. So this is. Which I didn't yeah. know before. <laughs> but it's too like. I think the point of the slurm command is that it makes it look a little bit nicer. So. Um, yeah, like it requires a whole lot of different parameters to get something useful out of S account. Yeah, you need a minus L and then a for long and detail, and then it's not super nice. Mm, let me try. You that. have lots of information, but it's the formatting is, um, is a bit messy. Yeah, that's a bit hard to read. I can use less to see. Yeah, like this. Things. But still, that's, yeah. OK, what about the sf command? We talked about this yesterday. So sf with a job ID number, and it shows us what ran the CP. Can you again increase a bit the font? Oh, yes. There we go. So we see it is, this tells us it used 90% of the CPU and one megabyte of memory. So this is probably incorrect because it was too short to get a good memory profile. Yeah, it samples it, I think, every 30 seconds mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. And this CPU efficiency is probably only 90% because it was so short. So what should we do and, next? Oh, and before we go there, I have good news for Anne. So very soon, Seth will also be available on Norwegian clusters. So this is in the works. Nice. OK, the next so, step will be um, now we want to have more cores. Yes. And we also want to make some mistakes. That won't be difficult, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because we want to see how it looks when we ask for the wrong number. Yeah. So should we try running this on five cores? Yes. That's usually what we, we do initially, because we think mm -hmm. this is parallel, but sometimes we haven't mm -hmm. compiled with parallel yeah. MPI, for instance, and we still want to run it, so we increase the number. Of yeah. I've done it many times. 
but asking for a number that is not a multiple of two. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> That's weird. So should we do four? No, I think five is fine. I, I, five, I, think I, I wouldn't have tried. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, have I revealed that I think in decimal instead of binary? <laughs> OK. So let's submit it. Uh, so we use sbatch on it. And we have slurm q that tells us what's running. So there it is. So what should we do? Should we SF it first? Or do you want to look at the output first? Yeah, show the output first, probably. So, well, it's the typical thing. Mm, yeah, about like expected. And then we SF it. So we see. 20% used of 45 seconds, which is exactly one fifth. Hmm. So what do you think went wrong here? I need to increase the number of iteration. That's what I would do. Hmm. Well, I guess that one, one of the cores was busy and the other ones were waiting and doing nothing. Yeah. So why is that? I don't think this is necessarily what a user would think when when you see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, well, that's what we have to cover here. So the problem is that just by asking for more cores and more resources doesn't make an arbitrary program actually use them for anything. So a program has to be specifically designed to use more things. So if you have, say, MPI, for example, then that may automatically understand everything and then use multiple cores. But otherwise, not necessarily. So when you browse uh, documentation on supercomputers, you often see MPI examples message passing interface. You see OpenMP examples. Mm -hmm. And so how can I find out whether which one to use? How can I find out whether the code that we have right now can use MPI or OpenMP or both? Mm -hmm. How do we know? Yeah. And Without trying we... everything. Yeah. Yes. I mean, one way would you try and show a look at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I also I... wanted to say, uh, mm. sorry, just wanted to say thanks also for the many comments on, on Twitch. So it would yes. be would be nice to have these tools available, like Jobload and these helper tools. Oh, yes. Tools. Yes. And also, good point, array job. I think we will yeah. show something. Yeah. So yeah. is that too it's... early to ask now? How do we find out? How do we know? Or well, what do mm. we? So what is your method? I... <laughs> Gripping yeah. in the code? Yeah, so what I do, if if you have the source code, and in this case, we have the source code here, because that's the pi.py, mm -hmm. then I like to grab for MPI. Mm -hmm. If this is a Git repository, I like to git grab MPI. And the other things I like to git grab for or grab for is OMP. Or okay. Pragma. But I, I, you would search for MPI underscore, no, probably. Hmm. Maybe because yeah. MPI will will appear may, many times. Yeah. I think I will try MPI because if it's uh, if it's like a Fortran code or a C code, then. No, you're right. Underscore. Yeah, yeah, underscore makes sense because all the functions are MPI mm -hmm. underscore something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, yeah. So it doesn't have My... it, obviously. Yeah. 
And my general rule of thumb for that kind of thing is if it's MPI, it will probably be a little bit obvious from the documentation. If it's open MP, then it is probably not very obvious. And if it's something else, then, well, good luck. It can also yes. be a message to people who are making programs to clearly say how it's parallel and how to control that parallelism because you can't assume that it will just work. If you make your program that automatically uses every CPU it finds, then that makes it really hard to run. So let's do something and let's look at the help for this program and see. So I see a keyword here, which is threads. And it says number of threads using multiprocessing. So knowing that this is Python, this tells me immediately, well, it also tells me because I wrote this, but it says that this can use multiple processors on the same computer. So the implementation detail using multiprocessing doesn't matter too much for our purposes. But what matters is there's a way to tell it how many CPUs to use. So should we modify our script to use this and then resubmit it? So we should have searched for multiprocessor or multiprop something in addition to OMP and MPI. Because many Python, many Python code will have similar. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. OK. So let's go back to the script and tell it threads equals five. Yeah. Does this look good now? That looks good right now, but it, I think we will get into trouble later. But that's really good that you wrote it this way. Yes. So slurm Q, it says it's done. Uh, Seth. Uh, Seth, and I'll copy and paste the job number. Hmm. Zero percent of everything. But it was very fast. Yeah. It says. Slurm script. What? Uh -huh. Ah, is the argument parsing in this bad? Hmm. Well, that's to... the first mistake. I... That's good. Do we need to provide all of them named? Probably not, I think. So another thing to check is the list of argument of the program. Yeah, let's look again at the help for the thing. So threads is that. Yeah, and the number of iterations. Yeah. Should work. And I would bet this uses arg parse. Yeah, so it uses arg parse, so the order shouldn't matter. Well, I don't know, let's try again and see. So I spatch it. Slurm Q. Mm. Three. Yeah, and great suggestion on yeah. on Twitch to instead of hard coding the value to use a variable and we will uh, mm -hmm. we will improve that. Yeah. OK, so here we see in the output, it says it's using five threads of 2 million iterations each. So now we can SF it. I really don't know why it didn't work the first time. So here we see CPU utilized 9 seconds, CPU efficiency 60% of 15 seconds wall time, which is still kind of low. But my guess is that it's just too short to really use everything. Should we submit one that's longer and see if it gets better? 
You mean with more iteration? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or we ask for more threats, and maybe the efficiency will go even lower then. Mm -hmm. Ah, you want to do... So, yeah. so what strategy would you use now when you have such code? You would increase the number of threads or try... I would try two normally. Yeah. If I yeah. can. Fewer. But let's let's change it out to two up there. Mm -hmm. And okay. four, four, two. But let's not. Uh, yes, yes, and we did five. Yeah. Stop for a moment because now what what often happens is that somebody gets a script from a colleague, and now we want to change from five to two, and we did it, but we didn't know that down there, there's the stress. We have to change it also. So I have often seen mistakes that, and I've often made mistakes where I change it in one place, but not in the other place. And to prevent that would be nice if we, instead of the threads equals five, and that was suggested yeah. on, on the chat, if we use a variable. Should we do that now already? So this variable is slurm CPUs per task, and that yellow is a bit hard to read. There you can see it. And I'll remove the space. So what does this variable mean? Should we increase the number of iterations? Or I guess, no, this is good, yeah. It's, we have two now, and you know, yeah. OK, so we've submitted it. We slurm Q. We see it's running. And it's done. And SF it. And we see 80% efficiency, which is certainly better. Yeah, and as you said, that if you probably increase the number of darts, uh, mm -hmm. the number of tests, uh, we will probably maybe get better efficiency. Yeah. So to make it, to make it, to make the code spend more time there where it runs parallel. Mm -hmm. Should we do that as a test? Yes. Yeah. Let's make it 10 times more and submit it. So one thing I'd like to ask is what happens if you request fewer CPUs than you actually need? How do you detect, um, how do you detect this? So the only way I know of is to SSH to the node itself and to run top and see how many processes you're trying to use. Um, I sometimes add print statement. I don't know if this is good. <laughs> yeah, I will no. show them one way on, on our cluster how you can find it out. Okay. But I think logging into the nodes Maybe yeah. you can show that if let's make it a bit longer. Yeah. It, it is a bit longer. No, it's running, still yeah. running. Yeah, that so can you SH into the compute node and have a no. look there? It's too late already. Okay. We can, How we, about can we, make it even? we can break it and then use more resources than we have and then make Oh yeah, if you use a lot more. Yeah. Like right now it's won't have a problem. So we see 96% efficiency, which is starting to get there. But here it's a bit confusing because you could see, think it, it is good to have a higher efficiency, no? Mm, what do you mean? So this is good. Right now there's but, no problem here. What did we put in the slum, in the job? So this is match. So we request two CPUs and we're running. Oh yeah, two now threads. we use two. Yes, it's but good. let's try this. So we set want to oh, do yeah. ten threads and run the same hundred million iterations. And now we're gonna have a problem. Because now these ten threads will stomp on each other and they will but because we only have yes. two core two cores. Yes. So our cluster does use C groups to limit the number of processors you can use. 
So that means you can't be using someone else's processors. Which is good. Yeah, and like NSC Cap says, it will look good in SF because it will seem like it's using all of the processors, when in reality, uh, it's not. Or when in reality, it's trying to do more than it should. And that's what makes this so hard to yeah. find out. So here we see it's running on CSL4. So I SSH to that node. Uh, does this print only my users' processes? I don't want any other usernames to show up here. Let's try. Yes. So here we are. We're on the node. And if we look down here, we see there's no, all, your Python. all of these different Python things running. And there should be 10 of them. And we notice that all of them are using about 49. Well, they're fighting over two CPU mm. cores. So they're all running at some low efficiency. And only two of them can be running at a time. So this is bad. And well, now it just finished. So let's look at SF. And it's bad because we only compute here. Yeah. Yeah. So they should all have the same CPU. Mm -hmm. so but here, here it looks good. <laughs> yeah. Like and this is what is uh, <laughs> always very annoying. Mm -hmm. So we see the wall clock time is 54 seconds. And CPU used is about twice that. So yeah, there's no way to tell what the problem was here. What was the SF of the one that was correct? Is it here? It's basically the same, only slightly better. But there are some programs that will be much worse if you're oversubscribing the CPUs. OK, so one final question. What if we wanted to run this on? Um, what if we want the same submit script to work on the cluster and off of the cluster? How could we do that? What are the things that we would we might need to do? So I guess the S run would be a problem yeah. if I'm not on a cluster. Yeah. So that should go. And the threads. How would one detect the number of CPUs you have? Um, on your machine. Yeah. So maybe what I would do is tell the program that if it give if it gets no arguments, then it should automatically use all available processors, which would be, um, well, which the programming language can probably find. But we can test for these environment variables. So we can say, if, mm, let's see. If... We have the suggestion to use this uh, endpoint, mm -hmm. which is probably what I would use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, does threads equals endproc work within Slurm too? I guess if it uses C groups, then it does. So my understanding is this would always work everywhere. OK, nice. I didn't know that, actually. We should be advertising this more. Mm -hmm. So, any thoughts? Yeah, it will. Uh, we have the command that it will fail on many sites. So, yeah, I don't <laughs> think it's uh, easy to find a, a generic yeah. way to specify. What if we did if? So we can use the shell script to. Oh, the variable if they exist. Yeah. yeah. 
So That's if, fancy. if the variable is non-zero, then... So in my field, we are a bit heavy. We would write a script that would write the job <laughs> with the correct number of threads, which probably is not best. It's probably better to do what you're yeah. doing right now. So here I've adjusted the script. So if this variable is non-zero, which is a good sign that it's actually running within Slurm, then it will set the threads variable to the argument we need for it. And, and else? then else it does nothing and it leaves it off. Or I oh, could say, well. You don't define it? Or? Well, I mean, it really depends on what system you have and what what your needs are, but I would say I think, maybe one. No, on a... yeah. Well, I mean, once yeah, you have the shell script here, to... you yeah. can do whatever well, you want. Yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's nothing, then this just becomes nothing on the command line, so it defaults to whatever the default is. Okay. But it's maybe good practice to uh, to set it to one by default, so you don't. Uh, yeah. 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 And in this case, hmm? oh, go ahead. and in this case, the default in the program is one. So I'm happy like this. Okay. Um, I wanted to change one one more thing in the script. Oh, but okay. it will make your script fail. <laughs> okay. But I think it's uh, it's good thing to add this set yeah. o set dash o r exit set dash o no unset. Something I haven't done for many. Oh years, yes, but I do yes. It now always. Um. So error exit. That's the one thing. Mm -hmm. So whenever there is an error, we want it to stop. And the other one is no unset. Treat unset variables as errors. Yes. And then you will have a problem with your yeah. thread <laughs> on, if you are not on the cluster. Should we try Actually, running? Actually, that's a, that's a very good practice. And I, I've seen in, a, in the example on the Norwegian uh, HPC, yeah. you always ha they have it. It's really good practice. And it's really good because you could make a typo in a variable. And some people do yeah. like rm dash rf variable slash something. And then if you make a typo, you suddenly start removing things or mm -hmm. weird things happen. Do these have to be separate options? So I, I... in my example, I have them on two lines. Two lines, mm -hmm. yes. Set all. I guess they can be combined. I don't know how. Yeah. No on set. OK. Yeah. Yeah, so it says that this, this fails on line nine. And this is also great because now you yeah. have you have some you have a render script not through Slurm, mm -hmm. and suddenly the Slurm variables are undefined. Yeah. And that line nine is here. So if no unset is set, how do you detect if a variable is set or not set? Or would we disable it right before this and do it? Well, there's probably some way to do this. Mm -hmm. You do a, a or. You yeah. check something or. Uh... Mm -hmm. So maybe the no answer is a bit too strict here, but it's good to know about the setting. Yeah. OK, we've got several questions in HackMD. Does this cluster have hyper-threading enabled? And... Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> So the answer there is that it does not on most nodes, because um, our policy is to turn it off everywhere, because usually for computationally intensive tasks, you want one process per processor. But there, surprisingly, there are a few nodes where we've forgotten to do that, and then it has appears to have twice as many processors, so that's a little bit of a trap. Mm -hmm. And the next question is being answered there already. OK, so we had some more examples to do. So would someone like to demonstrate an MPI code? 
Oh, yes, sorry, I was typing. Yes, I can. Okay. Let me know when your screen is ready to be shared. Yeah, I need to work on it. So what we're going to do next is sharing uh, or running programs that can run across multiple nodes using MPI. So with that, it's a different model. So these, well, Okay, I'm just resizing windows here. Let me yeah. show you I can check out what it looks now. So I think I'm kind of ready to Okay. Yeah. To show something. There you go. So yeah, as I was saying, there's two main models of um computing. One is shared memory and one is message passing. So this model here is sort of confusing because or what we did before is sort of confusing because it's not MPI which is message passing and it operates more like shared memory even though it's using multiple processes that are communicating and actually are passing messages using multiprocessing. But anyway here we go with um Saga. Yes. So this is, we are now in Norway on a computer, supercomputer called Saga. And I cannot highlight here because Zoom doesn't prevent me from like grabbing certain screens. Anyway, hmm. so I created this example, which is, uh, it's a similar example to, to what you did. So mm -hmm. we will again compute by, by throwing darts and counting how many land inside a circle. But now we have, and we should put on the HackMD where uh, this code example, where we took it from. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The thing that is now a little bit different here that we have, we are importing this MPI for Python. And we also have a couple of these MPI functions. For instance, uh, these ones here. So we create a communicator, and we communicate then results between between tasks. So first of all, how would I know that this is an MPI able Python code? Grab I MPI example. So here we don't search for MPI underscore. Yeah. We only oh, search yeah. for MPI. MPI, underscore MPI would dot. Not work. <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't That's right. Yeah, you don't find mm -hmm. anything. And okay, so that's the that's the Python script. Mm -hmm. And I have here my run script. Let me check what I this is something I drafted before the show. Let me walk you through it. So in this case, I have to specify the account. I'm giving the name. I'm asking for a time, one minute. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe it will take two minutes. Yeah. One gigabyte per, per CPU. I want it to run on four, on oh, four uh, tasks. So Here why did you choose one that gigabyte? What is yeah. the rationale for you? It's always uh, it's, tricky. It's, pro it's probably too much. Or uh, here, I happen to know that every core I think has two gigabytes, so I'm asking for one, which is less than everybody has. But it's probably too much, so I would probably run and have a look at the memory profile, or I would reduce this until I know how much it consumes. Mm -hmm. So it's good if I knew how much it consumes. It would be good to ask for not maybe twenty percent more. Here, in this case, I am I ask. For way too much, but it doesn't matter because one gigabyte is not terribly much. It would be- But it's mostly if... because you use on uh, less than yes. a node. Yeah. It would be a problem if I did this 10 gigabyte. Yeah. Because what, what would it mean? It would mean that although I ask only for four processors, the machine will actually give me, the machine will reserve how many? 20. 
right? Because because I want ten gigabyte for each of them, mm. but each of them already has only only has two. So I would get. So the computation would run on four processes, but I would pay for twenty. Can we uh, remove the memory if we don't specify anything? Do we have yeah, a default? On this, on this machine, that, that machine will complain. So if I remove it, it would say that I have to specify something. Yeah. Okay. So we always need to specify on this machine. So mm -hmm. then I have these settings. We talked about them. Here I unload, I unload all the modules because I want to want to make sure that I'm not somehow inheriting any the environment from somewhere else. Very good practice. And then I load this specific module, which is it's Python with some other Python libraries. Among them is this MPI for Python, which I need. And this is a specific version of it. And I guess if this is Intel, it has been compiled with the MPI Intel compiler, I guess. Yes. Right. Which is supposed to be good. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. So this will hopefully be efficient here. This is not great what I do here because I have we talked about it. It's I specify mm -hmm. four up here, but also down here. One way, one way to solve it would be that I say this. I think this is how it's called. This would be one way. This would then take the other way is what uh, Richard has shown, and this is also what is recommended on on our clusters is to do this instead because this will do the right thing. It will take mm. that uses the variables for storm yes. too. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope yes, only should. Yeah, okay, but that's a good point because I uh, I don't think I, I knew very well why uh, we had to use it. S run. Because on at least on that cluster, S run is will not only you have not only you spare yourself specifying this in two places, but it will also make sure that it places the tasks correct, correctly. You are mm -hmm. guaranteed to have good task placement. Mm. What does it mean or, by good task placement? Like that if the rank like you, the communication yeah. ranks are in. For instance, here, if I say I want two nodes and four tasks on each node, it will make sure that I really have four. Four of them run on one node and four of them on another mm -hmm. node. Mm -hmm. let's, let's try it out. Um, and this, the pi MC, that, that's a different thing. But let's, let's submit as batch. Boom. Let's see whether we are queued. We are queued, and hopefully not too long. Before the show, it started <laughs> immediately. But you are in the <laughs> normal queue, no? Did you I, put it? I think I. I saw I did, OS yeah. equals devel. Oh yeah, okay, so that's so fine. Devel, which which is for the yeah. debugging. Now we are running. That's good. We are running, and we are running on this node C one fifty four. If I wanted, I could SSH into that node. And have a look, but it's already too late. It's finished, and I got this summary here. Uh, and this is now an MPI version of estimating pi. And the other main advantage is we can use many more cores. Yeah, here I'm not limited to staying on the same node. I could ask for many cores on many nodes. Mm -hmm. For this, it would be good to make the, the example a bit longer. And then one interesting thing to, to do would be to study how it scales mm. to maybe increase the number of cores until until I don't get any more advantage of adding more and more and more cores. I wanted to show two commands, which I promised to show, which are useful on the Norwegian supercomputing clusters. And one is called under underload. And this will list. It will list loads or nodes where something is running, and it's consuming a lot less than it asked for. So you don't want mm. to you don't want to see the node that you don't want to see your your node here. 
<laughs> but it's, it's, it's past, so it's, uh, it's uh, history? Or? It, it, these are things running right now. OK. Um, and I don't want to know look, look because these are some other users. I don't want to expose them here, but um, it's not is... so many nodes. I mean, actually, it's good. Yeah. Well, it, it, there is some cutoff, so I think it's it shows I don't know twenty of them or ten of them. Oh yeah, then, okay. There is also <laughs> o overload. So is oh. load from the Linux load average? Yes. So this okay. This should be it. Should be one, I think. Okay. Or two? Mm. No, it should be one. So these uh, um, you can also check overload, and these are there are some jobs where things are cramped. They are using more than they ask for. Mm -hmm. Something is not right here. So this can be useful. We also have um, a web interface to this, which I wanted to show, but there is some problem with it today. But um, mm -hmm. maybe I can show how to find it. Yes. So on the documentation sigma two dot no. Uh, what I can recommend to do here on no Norway is monitoring jobs, monitoring jobs. And there is some info on how you can get this information, but uh, the two services are this Slum browser, where you can yeah, nice. uh, see all the running jobs and you get graphs. And I wonder if I can log in now, but I think maybe not because, oh yeah, <laughs> all right, okay. Oh, okay. yes. And is this package name called Slurm Browser? Yeah, it's Slurm Browser. It's it's out on GitHub, and I think it doesn't show right now because I'm not on the VPN. I need to be on the mm. university network. Mm -hmm. Are there some screenshots here? Anyway, so the, this is what I recommend here on the Norwegian clusters to get. You will see. I wish I could show some screenshots now, right now. But you will yeah. see uh, whether a job is consuming too much or too little, too much memory or too little memory, and network traffic. Hmm. Nice. And you can identify yourself by the switch? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so here, well, I cannot show it right now, but you, you can search for your username, you can search for your job number or for the node number. And we can search for other username? You can also check for any other user because. Hmm. Anyway, it's a publicly funded resource, and yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I think it's okay to see. Uh, so you will see everybody else also. Mm -hmm. Same here. Nice. This is transparent. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> so this was an excursion. Um, I think again, I want to. Am I here on the terminal? Because I mentioned that at the beginning of the of the show, and I think I want to really repeat it. That's, that's the most important thing for me today to say that when I get a script from a colleague, and this is typically how we start, and I try to make it work for my example, mm -hmm. I like to start small. So grow into the example. I, sh I don't want to ask immediately for, you know, 400 cores <laughs> the first yeah. time I run it, because, because I will wait forever. So it will queue for one day or two, and then after two days, I, I will for find one out week, that, yeah. for one week, and then mm -hmm. after one week, I find out that I made a typo here in this line. Yes. So I start small and short, a few mm -hmm. minutes, few few cores, and then I grow the I grow the problem. The same thing is that when when you observe an issue and you want to report it. Mm. I mean, before I sent my example to the support line. Maybe it's good if I try to make this example smaller. Mm -hmm. If it crashes already after a few milliseconds, then there is no reason that the example should ask for, I don't know, three days uh, runtime, because it will queue long if the debugging will be hard. So it will grow into, into, the, into the job. And yeah. then once you have it calibrated, like once you know this is working and it's using the course efficiently, then then I have a nice calibrated example and then I can compute the entire table. Mm -hmm. You know, all the all the two hundred jobs, similar jobs that I wanted to run. Then I know. Yeah. Should I stop sharing now? 
Oh, I can switch back to us. So, yeah. There was a bit of a discussion about the memory settings. So, there's one question. So, in my script, I use dash dash mem, and you use dash dash mem per CPU. Any comments on that? What did you use? Sorry. So I used, I can show mine here. That. And then Radovan used basically. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I always use this main CPU. Yeah. So, what are your recommendations for people? What is mem only? Is it uh, that? Uh... So that's memory per node. Ah, that's per node. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I find the mem per CPU more explicit mm -hmm. because then when you, um, I mean. I have been already confused myself that I have, I thought that what I'm asking for is memory for the entire job. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised to yeah. find out that it's, it was per CPU. Mm -hmm. So that's why I prefer more explicitly. So then I know that this is really per CPU. And if yeah. I, if I ask for 20 CPUs, well, then I'm consuming in my case, 20 gigabyte. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's easier so. to compute actually, because if you increase the number of processors, you you usually yeah. uh, either you change a bit the memory or you yeah, don't have other, to change it. Yeah, exactly. The other advantage is that sometimes I like to, I don't want to decide on, I don't care on which node they are running. I just want 20 cores, I mean 20 mm -hmm. tasks, and I let the Slurm decide. So run it wherever. Mm -hmm. and then I don't have to change the setup. Yeah. I guess I've done, I've worked with data science people a bit too long where a typical case would be you load this massive data set into memory that might be 50 gigabytes or something. And then once mm -hmm. it's loaded, however many threads you have that are working on it, that doesn't increase the memory load. So I think the typical HPC method of doing things is that your memory scales with the number of processors. Say you're dividing the mm -hmm. task, like your simulation into different simulation boxes, and you know that each simulation box takes what one gigabyte or two gigabytes or something like that so that's how i sort of tell people to do things or recommend what i recommend that people do but i think it goes to show who i tend to work with because i have very few people that i directly support that do have something that scales per CPU. Also, maybe reacting to the comment on on Twitch, um, if I know that if I know that the CPU has two gigabyte, mm -hmm. should I ask for exactly two gigabyte? Mm. Mm. But that's what you explained before, uh, rather than it depends if you are using the full node or not, probably. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tend yeah. to also maximum like, pair memory pair. Um, yeah. Pair processor, and I have to admit that I don't always check the usage. <laughs> mm -hmm. Afterward. I mean, here our default is I think five hundred megabytes, which is small enough that it basically doesn't matter if it's wrong. Like going less than that, well, mm. you know, there's still the vast majority of the memory available. But yeah, also- Yeah, I think that's one disadvantage. If you have a, def a default, probably people will try without. Well, if you have to explicitly set mm -hmm. the memory, maybe we will ask for a lot more than we need and mm -hmm. we won't adjust yeah. to it. But at least we are aware of this memory mm. problem. Yeah. I don't know what is best. But... Yeah. For us, we can allow. Um, 
So we allow jobs to go over their requested memory, but if the node runs out of memory, whoever is most out or over then will be the first one mm. to get killed. So it's a little bit better if people under request their memory. Well, it's better if everyone requests the exact same amount, but overall it's better if people under request because then at least you're not blocking someone else from using that memory. But if you over request, it will actually reserve that much for you and won't schedule other jobs that won't fit, even if they could. Mm. We have these good questions on the chat. We need to check these out. Did you see a common problem is that people that people know that nodes have, for example, 96 gig gigabytes per node or three gigabytes per core. They then proceed to request mem equals 96G or mem per CPU equals 3G. Guess that's why that's bad. Hmm. Mm. Mm. So is the 96G exactly, if the node has 96G, do you al allow 96G to be allocated to the user's jobs, or do you reserve some from the, for the operating system? Yeah, and I, I think the answer is a bit further down there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, will be always less yeah. than the mm -hmm. max. Okay. There is also a question on I can D, mm -hmm. which is uh, how do you determine whether you should use OpenMP? Mm. Or, uh -huh. yes. or array jobs for your task. Who wants to see an example of an array job? In this HPC examples, um, I've got an array job that we can do with the Pi thing. Do you oh, want yeah, to okay. do that? Yeah, We're it's... a little bit over time, but maybe it's better to do it now than come back to it. I mean, let's let's show it and let's um, let's comment on that question. Uh, yeah. Of how to approach that? Okay. Well, I'm preparing. Can you comment on it? So I use array a, job a lot because we use the same code but with different input data. We have. Uh, okay. So I don't know what you will be using, Richard, like a Python mm -hmm. code. Mm -hmm. And it will take, for instance, one image as an input, and mm -hmm. do some image analysis, and it creates something mm -hmm. out of it, which yeah. is a result of an analysis. Mm -hmm. But you can do the same analysis, but on thousands of different images. Mm -hmm. They can yeah. all be done in parallel. Yeah. So if we have many, many tasks that don't need to communicate. Yes, like independent. They, to, mm -hmm. they are independent. They don't need to exchange any data. Then yeah. it's simpler with the array. It's just yeah. simpler because you don't need to you don't need to really modify the the script itself, so you don't need to do any programming there. Mm -hmm. One could solve it with OpenMP MPI, but then we would have to go in and program. And mm -hmm. if they don't need to, co if they are independent, then it's a bit an overkill. Actually. It's a bit of an overkill. Yeah. Can be done. I, I was wondering if uh, yeah. we could use uh, something like Snake Make would make sense mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Oh, should we? So, yeah, I guess we're almost out of time, but we could have a session where we just go through different ways to make array jobs and try to cover as many different or as many different yeah. arrays or workflow management systems like that. I mean, the array of jobs on uh, with slums is really super nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here, yeah, let's, say, let's, uh, let's show one example now, yeah. and then we can come back to that in a, in a separate show. Yeah. So here I've got S batch and say array one to 10, which means the same script will run 10 separate times. So I need to set a different seed for all of them. Otherwise it will do the same calculation every time. Actually, I wonder if it will. Let me look in the code. So mm -hmm. this is the pi example. So how does it seed it? OK. 
get random seed. And maybe I can seed. say that this is a really good scheme if, as we said, all of the tasks are independent, but also if all of the tasks are equally long, more or less. Mm -hmm. right? Does it matter? Mm. So what will happen if some of them take much longer than the others? Yeah. Uh, wow. Nothing, no. I thought they will, mm. uh, one after the other, they will finish. Yeah, like, I think each one ends whenever it ends. Yes. Yeah. But you have to reserve the maximum amount of time for any job, which might mean it takes a little bit longer to get started running, but, well. Oh, because the time is a total time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right, okay. Oh. No, I mixed yeah. it up anyway. Yeah, it, it okay. won't matter here. Yeah. Because they don't start at so, the same time, actually. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Or they may not start at the same time. So here we see the random seed is set to 42 by default. So that means every time I run this, it will take, it will do the same calculation. So actually, as an example, let's leave the seed off of here. And does anyone remember if capital A or lowercase a is the... Um, it will do it value. automatically, no? I mean, I don't even put this yeah. minus O when I do a job array. And it will create um, okay. a yeah. slum with a underscore let's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so let's do this. This is one million. I guess we can make this 10 million again. So let's submit it. Okay. And let's look at the queue. So we see here there's the job ID and there's one to 10 that's running. Yeah, this underscore one to 10, yes, you see. And it's still pending. Oh, now they're running. And now we see there's 10 things running. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, so they're all running and they're slowly finishing and they're done let's list our outputs yeah so here we see slurm underscore one and so on so let's take a look we see pi 3.1423 if we look at number two 3.1423 3.1423. So the problem here is that all of these are running with the exact same seed. So it's actually doing the exact same calculation 10 times. So by averaging these, we actually don't get any new information. So thus we need to adjust our script and add in the seed value. Uh, Did I get this right? Slurm array task ID. Or should um, I look it up? Slurm underscore array underscore task underscore ID. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Good. And I will submit it again. So now our goal here is to average all of these together to calculate a more accurate value of pi. So luckily I've got a thing that does that already. Uh, what's it called? Pi aggregation. And if we run this with help. Hmm. Okay, this does not have a good help to it. Uh, okay, I'll guess what it does. But first, let's look at these outputs. So here we see 3.1410, 3 3.1419, 3.1410, yes. and so on. Are these changing? Yeah, they're changing. OK, so I think that what I can do is Python 
and I give it all of these outputs. Hmm. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so we'd have to save all of the results to a separate JSON file to accumulate. Mm. Okay. So here, would you use a, like a step for a job to put the dependencies if you wanted to mm. run all the array of jobs and then when they are, the last is done, you start to aggregate the results? How would you do that? Because I can yeah. see we could do it using a workflow management system like yeah. SmithMe. So here it's sort of a simple file system based approach. So every job writes its output to a separate file and then they all get, like after you're all done, you run something that reads in all of these and then mm -hmm. combines them or does whatever it is you need. But I'm starting to wonder if this is going to actually work. Oh, you need to save it in a different file. So maybe we are a little bit all the time. Huh? Yeah, maybe we need to come back. Well, yeah, I think we should probably stop now. But we can continue this next time, perhaps. So, yes. So what did we learn today? Any remaining questions? There is a learn question. Learn to start small. Show learn the... to start small. That's what I remember from Radovan. No? Yeah. I really like that. I think I'm going to add that to our documentation too. Mm -hmm. So. We got a request show the percent syntax. Is this the percent in the output variables or which one? Like percent A, percent. Hmm. For our job, I don't know the percentage mm. notation. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yes. Oh. So, oh, yes. You can have a step uh, like a post yeah. at uh, 1 5 or 1 10 percentage. Uh, so this two. means. Yes. Uh, I think this means only 10 or only five of these jobs can be running at a time. So you don't dominate yes. the whole cluster with it. But we have yes. a limit no pair user already on a mm -hmm. cluster mm -hmm. normally. But it, it, yeah. it can be quite nice actually to limit. The number. That's a good thing. Yeah. 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 Good point. That's true. Okay. Mm, so of our, ha, huh, there's the question. HackMD. How do you determine whether OpenMPI, OpenMP MPI are array jobs for your task? We talked about how to figure out if the program actually uses OpenMP or MPI, but. Yeah, but we talked a little bit about that already. I mean, we answered that, that mm. if it's if these are independent, then a ray job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, of course, if if this is a code that I got and it it is already MPI parallelized, then then it's different. Yeah. Yeah. In some sense, it depends. Yeah. If the codes already exist, then you use whatever it says. Yeah. Mm. And if you're making then, it yourself, then you've got a good question. Yeah, and in this case, they were the jobs were independent, but at, at the end, we needed to communicate. And I mean, Richard communicated through files mm. and mm. aggregated with a separate script. And if we wanted, one, one could have run it through OpenMP or MPI and aggregated the results inside the computation. Mm. But would require a bit more. So it mm -hmm. depends where we do it. And yeah. It would require some programming. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So yeah, I think we've actually covered everything we intended to, and a little bit more. So. 
Mm. Uh, yes, that's nice. A very good point in chat. So, if you make your jobs too small, then your cluster owners will get a little bit annoyed at you. So, if you submit one million jobs that each take five seconds, that's not exactly what you're supposed to do. And I think the rule of thumb here is pretty good. If it takes less than 15 minutes, then it's better to combine the jobs and make them longer rather than um, submitting more small ones. This is where uh, using this percentage can be nice because mm -hmm. then you, you can say, okay, I know it's maybe not the best, mm -hmm. but I limit the number of active jobs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they would still be very unhappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the worst thing, so if it's an array job, at least Slurm can efficiently control that. But if you make a script which will submit um, a million jobs, then that gets pretty bad because then all of them are a separate entity in the Slurm database. So, so why, why is it bad for a, a system administrator? So at least on our cluster, at one point, the number of jobs it would consider for backfilling, like for the scheduling, is was on the order of 30,000 or 50,000 or something like that. So when someone went and submitted 100,000 jobs, then all of these would be waiting in the queue. And then other people with a higher priority would not be able to run before these were actually okay. running. I thought they will, you will not be queued anymore. You are un not in the queue if you have too many. Well, I have done this very bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not entirely sure, but I think if you submit a huge array job, at least for scheduling future jobs, it's seen as one entity that can be scheduled. But I'm not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. And I see Cap probably can comment a little bit more on that. So we should try still to have a sufficient amount of work per job. Yeah, that's always a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of overhead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Super. Should we okay. close the show? Yeah. Well, thanks for watching. Thanks. I hope this is useful to you either now or watching in the future. So oh, we need to decide the topic for next time. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe should, we can announce it. Yeah. So Sh should we continue with the same thread or should we take a break and do something else before we go back to um, Mm. Mm. What else do we Go need to learn on the cluster? Yeah. Because now we know how to run uh, array of jobs. We need to recognize yeah. MPI, OpenMP, multi-thread, uh, multi-processing jobs. Uh, at some point, I want to show Singularity, how to run mm. containers. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's do that. And, and that can be on a cluster or somewhere okay. else. Should we do that next week? Next week is a cluster week, or no, a container week. <laughs> <laughs> we take a break from clusters and do containers. But it's still cluster. Yeah. You can run, you can run container on the cluster. It's not only cluster. Yeah, yeah it's not only, but this is a, a, maybe yeah. a good way to transition. Yeah. If you want to transition from your laptop to a yeah. cluster, okay. is Singularity a good approach? Yeah. Let's and say containers. Maybe Docker and Singularity. We, yeah. can, we can talk about both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Let's do that next week. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for watching and for great questions and answers and clarifications. Yes. yes. Yeah, Many this inputs. was good. a good chat here. Okay. So see you next week. Yeah, see you then. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.